Scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it under its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your, your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. With that scripture reading, we have the introduction to the next part of our study through Matthew and our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus identifies two things that we are to be as disciples of Christ. And so this morning with those four verses of scripture, we're going to take a look at a reason, a purpose, at, in fact the design of a disciple's influence on the world around him or herself. It's important for us to understand this because there is a reason why we are who we are and there is a reason why we are to live as we live. So I want us to examine that this morning. I want you to consider for just a moment before we go any further into verses 13 through 16, I want to remind you of what we just spent the last three weeks examining. We talked about the Beatitudes found in verses 1 through 12. And I want to remind you of some of the happy blessings that will befall us when we have certain very good, very positive attitudes. Things like being poor in spirit or those who mourn, those who gentle uh, are gentle, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are merciful, pure in heart, or peacemakers. These people will all be given blessings both in this life and in the life to come. And so when we look at those things, we see a very positive flow of Scripture. But then all of a sudden, we see something different. In verses 10, 11, and 12, we suddenly see that we're still going to be happy. We can still be joyful, but we'll be joyful in the midst of persecution if we suffer for the sake of Christ. He talks about blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Verse 11, when blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all evil against you because of me. In verse 12, he even reminds those in the first century as he would remind us today that people who have long since gone before us suffered at the hands of men for the sake of righteousness. It's very interesting that at the end of the Beatitudes, at the end of those happy tidings, that he now starts to talk about persecution, what the world is going to do to us. In fact, we are guaranteed that if we desire to live godly lives that we will endure persecution. So if we know that that is coming, how are we to respond? And that's where our lesson this morning comes into play. Because being the salt of the earth, being the light of the world, is in fact our response to the world no matter how the world treats us. Take a look in your Bibles, if you will, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Read with me that very first phrase. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, why salt? Why not pepper? Well, because salt can do a lot more than perhaps pepper can. It may serve some similar purposes, but salt, if you take a look at the concept and, and what salt actually is, it is an ingredient that has all kinds of positive effects on things. Uh, it can be used as the preservation of food. Uh, it can be used to uh, help with the taste of food. And there are lots of other things that are mentioned, but he tells us, that we are to be salt because one of the things that salt does is it influences the environment around it. 
It has an impact on it. And that is what God wants for us today. That's what Jesus was teaching. As we live in this dark world full of sin, He does not want us to simply accept that fact as the way it's going to be and the way it'll always be and you're not going to have any kind of impact on it. No, rather, He wants us to be that influence on it. First and foremost, in 1 Peter chapter 2, and verses 21 through 23, we read that Jesus suffered at the hands of the world, but in so doing, He left for us an example that we might follow. We read, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus was a positive influence on the world around him. Remember in the days of Noah that we described the world as being a world that was full of sin, where the thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually? Well, the thoughts of Christ's heart were only good continually. And he had a good influence on the world around him by the words that he spoke and by the deeds that he performed. And he left us that example that we might follow. He tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, that we are to go as disciples and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now one of the things that we learn from that is that there is going to be a certain manner of teaching or preaching that is involved. These are things that take our words, and words are important. Instruction is important. Opening up the Bible and sharing with people God's will is absolutely necessary if we in fact are going to have the best influence on them possible. And I would certainly not say the following concerning the Word of God, but you've heard the saying, words are cheap. Talk is cheap. And that's true if, in fact, we do not back up those words with our actions. That's why in Titus chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, Paul would instruct Titus that in all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Now I want you to consider for just a moment the Pharisees in Jesus' day. It is true that on occasions they taught false doctrine, but one of the things that Jesus said on one occasion is, listen to what they're saying, because what they're saying is correct, it's just what they're doing that's incorrect. Okay, now consider that in our lives today. It is important, and even in this passage of Scripture from Titus, we are taught that we need to be pure in our doctrine or our teaching. We are to be sound in our speech or the words that we utter. But at the same time, he says, show yourself to be an example of good deeds. Live your life in such a way that you will live above reproach so that people cannot say that he's like a Pharisee, that he's like a hypocrite that he says the right things, but he doesn't do the right things. Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying that we as Christians, we as disciples, we have a purpose for being here, and that's to be the salt of the earth, to be an, a positive influence on the world around us. Why? Why do that? Well, Paul answers that, pass, that question in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 22. When he says, I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. Why does Jesus want us to be an influence on the world around us? Because when He left this world, He left His disciples in charge, 
in charge of the teaching and the preaching, but in charge of the example and the influence so that other people could see Christ living in us, so that other people could see the God of the heavens above that we follow and that we serve. If you go back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, where Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, he then poses a question. In the New American Standard, he says, if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? Other translations say if the salt has lost its savor, or if the salt has lost its flavor, or if the salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? He says, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. This is the kind of question that I would expect to ask in my high school class, and they would answer it so very eloquently. What is salt? And their answer would be, something that's salty. <laughs> and you have to give them credit because that's what it is. There may be more to it than that. There may be a, a greater definition that Mr. Webster assigns to it. But what is salt? It's something that's salty. And when salt ceases to be salty, it really ceases to be salt. It ceases to be that influence. It, it ceases to be that enhancement on its environment. And that's one of the things that we've got to, uh, to question. How impactful are we on the world around us? What kind of difference are we making? You know, there's a great little verse in the book of Job. Job chapter 6 and verse 6. Can something, ta can something tasteless be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Now let me ask the look at the first question first. Can, any, can something tasteless be eaten without salt? Well, in modern day America the answer is yes, and probably in greater abundance than we should. There is an old rule of thumb that I was taught when I was coming up through school and, and obtaining my business degree. They said when you go and apply for a company, for a, a higher end company, they will interview you in the morning and they will interview you in the afternoon, but don't forget that when they take you out to lunch, they're still interviewing you. And they're watching you to see what kind of decisions you make. And they said never salt and or pepper your food before you've tasted it. Taste it first, and then if it needs it, add it. Why? Because they are determining that you have already made up your mind that it needs it. You're not determining whether it actually does or it doesn't. They're saying that you have basically already made or made up in your mind a preconceived notion of how things are to be. Well, if you taste something and there's little taste to it, then you may in fact add salt or pepper to a particular food. The item of food that's mentioned here is the egg. And how many of us, especially with a hard-boiled egg, eat it with a little salt or a little pepper alongside it? That's how my mom raised us. But because of that, and because that's kind of how I still eat it many times today, when I ran across this verse of Scripture in my studies, I had to stop. And since my wife had some hard-boiled eggs in the refrigerator, I went in there and I took a bite of a hard-boiled egg, but I tried not to bite into the center. Tried not to eat that yellow part. Wanted to just eat the white part. Now listen, I've eaten it how many times in my life? Hundreds, if not thousands of times in my life. But I wanted one time to just taste the white for what the white was. And interestingly enough, the passage of Scripture is right. It has texture. I could probably figure out in my mouth if somebody blindfolded me that it was probably the white of an egg, but it really doesn't have much taste, if any, at all. So maybe that's why some people add salt to a food like that, to give it some flavor. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. The same passage of Scripture that's used in the parallel account in Mark 9 and verse 50 reads, Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Salt itself, the mineral, does not revitalize itself. Once it's worn out, once it's 
lost its salty savor, then it's not good for anything except to be trampled under the foot, thrown out. Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12 reads, I say to you, that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom, I want you to think about that. Many people will want to dine at this table, but the sons of the kingdom, the sons of the king, will be cast out into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because you can call yourself salt all you want. But if you're not salty, then what good are you? You can call yourself a disciple of Christ. But if you are not doing the designed work of a disciple, what good are you? To those disciples who do not influence the world around them for good, they are in for a rude awakening. We are very familiar with that passage of Scripture from Matthew chapter 25, verses 41 through 46, who, where before this particular passage is, is read, we find a group of people who are considered on the right hand of Jesus. On the, they're considered the sheep. They are considered the ones who are saved because although they may not have been consciously aware of all the good that they were doing, they were doing good to their fellow man. They were making an impact on the lives of those around. But Jesus says, starting in verse 41, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you, didn't, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It is a very simple thing for me to pose the question, if Jesus were to come back tonight, would you be here? I think that's a pretty easy question to answer because not only would many of us be happy to be able to sit at the feet of the real, true master. But I think many of us would be afraid not to. And I think we would have an, a marvelous count on our attendance if that indeed were the case. But Jesus says to those people around you that you see, what you do or you don't do is what you do or you don't do to me. And so it's very interesting. I go around Sebring, Florida, and, and I meet people from time to time in the community, and they say, who are you? I say, I'm Kevin Patterson. A, a conversation comes up that I'm a preacher. Where do you preach? I preach for the Sebring Parkway Church of Christ. Uh, we meet over at, and a lot of times I don't even get the address out before they say, are you the guys with the clothing room? They know that we give away clothing. We don't sell clothing. We don't make money. We give things away to those who are in need. We give food away to those who are in need. To other to situations that, are, uh, that present needs in other arenas, we help in those as best we can there as well. But the idea is that we want to have a positive influence on the world around us. We want to be the salt of the earth so that indeed the world that is lost in sin, that is spiritually without flavor, can have just a taste of what it's like to be on the side of the Lord. Take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. 14 through 16 all deal with the same topic, and it's dealing with the idea that you are the light of the world. Now let's make sure that we understand some basic principles of light. What is the purpose of light? 
Well, one might say to overcome darkness. Once again, uh, if I asked the, the teenage class, what is light? They would say, well, it's that stuff that brings light into a situation. Okay, once again, that's true. Light illuminates. Light brings illumination or light to a, the darkness around. Without it, things cannot be seen because we are left in the dark. In John chapter 11 and verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. Now think about that. That's just the light of this world. If these lights were turned out, if we met at 9 or 10 o'clock at night when the sun has already gone down, if all of the lights outside were turned out, how many of us would have a difficult time making our way into the auditorium, finding a, a particular pew that is empty without stumbling over somebody, not knowing that they were there? Light allows us to see. Well, in a spiritual sense, the word light is used to allow us to see truth, to allow us to see what is right in the sight of God. Once again, Jesus would say in John chapter 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus says, I bring spiritual illumination to you. I'm going to allow you no longer to stumble around in the darkness of sin. I'm going to be to you the light of life. Not only the life of this world, so that you can live apart from the death of sin, you can live spiritually here, but so that you can live spiritually one day in heaven. I am the light of life. In John 1 and verse 9, Jesus was described as the true light who, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He did this through the teaching of the truth, the teaching of God's will. All right, now remember what Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14 reads. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. A city set on a hill. If a city is down in a valley... You cannot often see it unless you're on top of a hill looking down at it. But a city on a hill, a light source set on the top of a mountain can be seen for miles and miles and miles. The same principle is taught in Mark chapter 4 and verse 21. And he said, a lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on the lampstand? What is the purpose of a light? Is it not to shine? And what is the purpose of a good light? Is it not to shine so that all can see? We understand what it's like to have a dim light. We understand what it's like to have a flickering light. And we understand what it's like to have a light go out. So if you have a nice, bright, and shining light, you don't put it down in the valley. You don't hide it under a basket or put it under your bed. In all truth, if we were to do an audit of everyone's house right now, how many would find, how many homes would we find a chandelier well lit under the bed? You laugh because that's ludicrous. That's preposterous. You don't put a chandelier under a bed. You put it up high so that all can see from its illumination. That is the principle for us. We are to be the light of the world. And God does not want us to hide this light of truth. He wants us to put it in a place where everyone can see. When Jesus said in Mark 16, 15 and 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all of creation, he was saying, go into the world and shine the light of truth so that those who have embraced the error the lie of darkness, can see and be saved. We are to not only preach, though, the light of the world, we're not only to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ, 
We are to exemplify the good news of Jesus Christ. We're to live the light of the Lord to the world around us. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, the apostle Paul said, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. We are to walk as children of light because that's the right thing to do. We are to walk as children of light because that's what pleases our Father. And we want to please our Father so that He will say to us, Well done, good and faithful servants. But we also walk as the light in this world around us so that we can make an impact on it. So that others can see the light in us and it will make a difference for the good in their lives. Remember back in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men in such a way as they may see your good works. We are to be about good works in this world. Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 through 16 reads, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world holding fast the word of the life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. We are to work out our own salvation. In fact, if we are doing what is right as children of God, Paul said it is God who is at work in us, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. He also reminds us that we are children of God in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation. And that being the case, we are to not simply be good, bright, shining light so we can see the way. We need to be those bright and shining lights so that others can see the way. We want to make sure that they understand what the true path that brings light to our life is all about. But is that really the end of it? Because verse 16 has something very important tacked on to the tail end of it. We are to be lights, and we are to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. Why? do we say wholesome things to glorify God? Why do we do good deeds to glorify God? We do these things because we want to glorify God in our lives, but we also are the light of the world so that others can see God working in us so that others can see the light of truth in our lives and so that others can then glorify God who is in heaven. You know, when I read this passage of Scripture, I could think about a lot of different people in the Bible who fall into this category, but I remember Jesus and two people that He was confronted with at the, at the cross. He was confronted with one thief who hurled insults at him, but because he didn't hurl him back, in the end, that thief on the cross sought the pardon of our Lord. He saw the light of God shining. I think about the Roman centurion who heaped insults and 
probably ridiculed, was probably a part of the casting of lots before Jesus died on that cross. But I remember what he said at the end when he said truly, and he acknowledged that this indeed was the Son of God. I want you to consider for just a moment that what he saw was also the light of truth, the light of life, which was in our Lord and Savior Jesus. The question for us is, when people come in contact with us, do they see that light? Do we have an influence on them by being the salt of the earth? And do we impact their life for goodness because we are trying to be a bright and shining light set upon a hill? Do people notice that there is a difference between the way we talk and the way the rest of the world talks? Do they see a difference between the way we act and the way the rest of the world acts? Do they see a difference between how we react and the rest of the world reacts? Do they see in us what we see in our Lord? Do they see the light of truth and the light of life? That should be our goal and that should be our aim. If you are not a child of God this morning, that means that you have not yet stepped out of the darkness and into the light. Obey the Lord this morning. Put into practice your faith that believes that indeed Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess His name. And then be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. Then you can become salt and start to have that positive influence on those around you. Then you can become light in a dark world and you can illuminate in the lives of others what was once illuminated in your life. And you can share that hope of salvation with those who have no hope at all. Are you the salt of the earth? Are you the light of the world? If not, make the decision to choose Christ today and become the influence and the example that He would have you be. And if you are a child of God and for some reason your salt has lost some of its savor or your light has dimmed because of the persecutions and the temptations of the world, here's the great opportunity to come to God with a penitent heart Ask for forgiveness and allow Him to make you saltier than you ever were, brighter than you've ever shined. And if the rest of us can help you in some way, let us know how we can because we want to pray with you and for you so that we can be the very best for God that we can be while together we stand and sing.